Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your grateful host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome so much to the show. So we are in a little short series called For the Love of Ending the Year with a Bang. <laughs> um, we can't help it as we kind of get to the end of the year. It's just we're thinking about closing some doors and opening new ones. And, you know, it's just a date on the calendar. Life is actually, you know, linear and just continues to move forward. But something about changing the calendar to the next year just invites us, right? Invites us to take stock, um, to look backward, to look forward. So this is what we call our benediction episode of the year. Um, We do it every year. It's to give this community and ourselves a second to pause and to reflect and then look forward in anticipation of what's coming. And I don't want to spend too much time right now going through the most painful communal memories of 2022, but every one of us knows that the world dealt us a lot of blows this year. There were losses, there were setbacks, um, but also worth noting, important to note, there was joy too. 2022 um, was really, from the get-go for me, an injection of some unexpected happiness, a new relationship that I didn't see coming, some healing, um, a continued growth. There were some beautiful parts of this year amidst the other things that were hard. And so that said, I want to spend some time also looking forward and thinking about our faith practices and how they serve us and how they operate during turbulence, because there's always turbulence. Of course there is. There's always change. There's always loss. There's always hard things is just as much as there's always joy. And so let's take some time today to reflect a little bit and briefly on what, what could faith look like? Um, activated in real lives. Oh, so I've asked the right person, just in case you're thinking, yikes, faith, you know, that triggers a lot of people. And we have, we bring a lot of baggage to the concept, be it from people or from church, whatever. But um, I want you to know that I hold the idea of our, our faith and with the most careful hands. I hope you know that about me by now and um, only bring, faith leaders to you that um, I believe serve us well and hold room for mystery and growth and curiosity, spiritual curiosity. And so today's guest is, I mean, (laughs) uh, she's led me through all kinds of seasons of life through her writing. I'm so grateful that she put her like beautiful faith down in pen and ink. She is a kind of a quiet powerhouse of influence and leadership in the faith space and really a harbor of peace. Um, Today we have Barbara Brown Taylor. We've had Barbara on the show before, but um, if you don't know this wonderful person, uh, I've got you covered. Barbara's a New York Times bestselling author. She's a teacher. She's an Episcopal priest. Her first memoir called Leaving Church That was the first book I've ever read of hers. One author of the year from Georgia Writers Association and her latest work, Rhythm of Prayer, was really just a masterpiece. And it was compiled and edited by one of our other favorites in the For the Love family, um, beloved Sarah Bessie. Barbara has been on Oprah, Super Soul Sundays. She's been on faculties of all kinds, Piedmont College, Columbia Theological Seminary, Emory, McAfee School of Theology. It just goes on and on. Her her credentials are very long, very amazing, and very inspiring. But even more inspiring is just her. It's just Barbara's soul. Um, It's her way of being in the world. And if you've never heard her, you'll see what I mean in just a minute. You'll hear um, the way she just quietly and wisely thinks and leads. And I I, I just don't know anyone like her. I really don't. I don't know anybody like her. And she's so special to me. And of course, if you didn't know this, for every show we do here on the For the Love podcast, we ask that final question 
what is saving your life right now? That question is borrowed from Barbara. And she asked this years ago, and it was so profound a question to me that I asked it in my very first show and every single one since. So all the credit and gratitude to Miss Barbara for that for the love staple as well. So this is a lovely connected conversation. It's hopeful. It's tender. It's sweet. It ended up with me crying and crying and crying. So stick to the end when Barbara reads a benediction she wrote just for the For the Love community. So without any further ado, please enjoy this benediction with the wonderful Barbara Brown Taylor. All right, Barbara, I'm so delighted to see you every time I ever get to be with you in any way virtual or in person, I feel so lucky. So thank you for, thanks for being here today. My deep pleasure. Thank you, Jen. So you've been on the show before and um, I filled in our listeners with a little bit about who you are um, for those of them who are new to you. But I wonder if you could just start here on this particular episode by sharing just a little bit about kind of where you are in the world right now, and maybe even what's been capturing your attention lately. I'll do that because I think it's important. All you can see is a library. I'd be outdoors if my broadband would go that far, but it won't. Mm -hmm. So I live on a farm in rural North Georgia, which means I spend a lot more time with birds and dogs and cats and horses and chickens than I do with people. So everybody listening should be cute. I am not a city person. I'm a rural person. And I'm also a person who just celebrated a birthday with a big zero in it. Mm. So I'm I'm a good end of the year a guest on your show. I'm, I'm a person, <laughs> a woman of a certain age. And mm. that has a lot to do with, with what we'll talk about as well. I can't reflect on a year without thinking about probably how few I have left. So mm. it increases my gratitude exponentially. Mm, I appreciate that so much. I am coming up on a birthday with a zero on it. It's a new, it's a new zero for me too. Um, and just realizing that it's becoming clear, like this really does, it really does go like this. It, life really does go like this. It kind of goes fast. And just like that, I'm, I'm probably past the halfway mark. And um, I appreciate I I look forward to hearing what you have to say about that. Um, As you know, because I've told you many times, your voice and your work have been a real guide, a comfort to me. You've been a real leader and um, mentor to me through many, many, many seasons of life, as it turns out. Um, But let's first talk about 2022 for you, maybe you just sort of touched on it just now, sort of from a high level, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what was good, what was hard, what, where Mm -hmm. did you grow? Um, what did you learn? Maybe a little bit of a highlight reel, um, of BBT's walk through 2022. Uh, I resisted picking up my calendar and giving you a literal answer to that. (laughs) So I think the most important thing to say is it's been uh, an odd liminal transition Mm. space between two heavy pandemic years Mm. and then seeing what comes next with really no assurance about what comes next, which I think for people of faith is a great walk, a great kind of trust Mm. walk. So my 2022 has been a lot about deciding how much normal I want to go back to Mm. and, and what kind of a tempo I want to live because at this point, everything's picking up again. And I have found myself rushing and busy and distracted. And I remember that too well. And there are not enough years left to live Mm -hmm. like that. So 2022 has been for me a a hinge year. It's been a year for uh, coming to terms with age, both Mm -hmm. the fear of what that means and the invitation that it brings, perhaps especially for a woman. I'm not sure about that. Mm But um, the fear is about the stereotypes. It's just amazing how many well-meaning people condescend to people with gray hair, you know, Mm. come up behind me when I'm riding a bike and say, you're doing a great job. And I want to say, 
Thank you. But I've decided to use the sidelining as a kind of um, way to get away with things. Like I can dress like I want now. That's and true. if my makeup's all over my face, nobody's really going to look close enough to notice. And mm-hmm. I've even experimented with being a little bawdier, rowdier. And, you know, why not make use of the stereotype of the eccentricity of age? So 2022, mm-hmm. I've been doing that, but I've also been pulling back from public life and living a lot more locally. Yeah. So when I look at the calendar, it's things like going to the county fair with yeah. two six-year-old girls and <laughs> her twins, or adopting an old broken down racehorse or bacon blueberry pie for friends going through hard times and volunteering at the public library and all kinds of things that are hard to to say to people who say, what are you working on now? Because they're looking for something big and productive. Of course. And, and I'm tending to relationships with people and creatures and it has been bliss it's been Mm -hmm. bliss though i have been of course like everyone fixed to terrifying headlines it's been a good year but um non-productive in a major way or or an impressive way so Mm -hmm. i'll be the the saint of small things today Mm -hmm. i love that that sounds comforting that -hmm. sounds like a relief what i also love i'm very interested in seeing a Bodier, Barbara, this is real exciting. So you can you can bet that I'll be paying attention to that version of you. That is real thrilling. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. And I know it's not fair. So when things go sideways, when something breaks, when stuff just isn't adding up or working, it's hard to know what to do next, which lever to pull or how to keep moving forward. It's normal to feel stuck. But therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy like better help the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. BetterHelp has connected more than 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient, secure, accessible anywhere because it's 100% online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and you can switch therapists at any time if something's just not working out. I discovered firsthand how powerful online therapy was in my own life when my marriage imploded. But even in life's less earth-shattering challenges, it's healthy and wise to have the discipline of professional therapy in your life. So you guys get unstuck and get on your way to being your best self with better help. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash for the love. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. <laughs> okay. So I want to talk for a minute about rhythm of prayer. This was Mm -hmm. a really beautiful collaboration that came out recently between you and quite a few very beloved authors um, uh, helmed by Sarah Bessie, who's one of my dearest and best friends. I was hoping that you might be able to talk about what rhythm of prayer means to you. What, what does that mean? Um, How can this idea maybe this practice, if you will, um, bring us comfort or, or a sense of presence, even healing during tumultuous times, which is always. Which is always. Yeah. Let's tag that. That can be our, yeah. our headline. That's um, right. Here's what's comforting to me is that a rhythm of prayer is both settling into what is, in mm-hmm. other words, the rhythm of a day, that early morning Praying is different from late night praying, Um, that there's a breath that comes several times every minute, and there's a rhythm of prayer that can be linked to that. But there's also a way in which, for me at least, a rhythm of prayer is a breaking of of the pattern of the day. It's it's literally a putting on of the brakes, you know, and, and stopping whatever I'm doing in order to attend like a lady in waiting to what's happening around me. So there's that. And and then seasons of prayer really matters to me. I prayed much differently in my 20s than I did in my 30s or 40s or now. So to be patient with the changing seasons and not insisting that spring be like fall or that winter Mm -hmm. be like summer, um, but to be patient with the rhythms and to trust 
to trust the change in them. So, mm -hmm. so both of those, the, there's a rhythm that is settling into a pattern. And then there's a, a point at which the rhythm means breaking the pattern to insert a slower rhythm, a more mm -hmm. attentive rhythm. And it changes through the seasons. So, I appreciate you saying that. I feel like a lot of, um, some of the, the parts of faith that I was handed earlier when I was younger, it carried with it this message that was both overt and covert, which was that change is suspect, that there should be a very fixed way that faith, that you practice your faith, that, that, that the, the consistency says something about your faithfulness. And change says something about your faithfulness that you, mm -hmm. and, and that hasn't been true for me at all. And I, mm -hmm. I appreciate hearing from someone like you that that is not just normal and expected, but even good, good. And it's good that our prayers change through the decades and that our faith even shifts and the way that we pray and how we even think about prayer, how I thought of how I think about prayer has changed drastically over the last 20 or 30 years. And so I thank you for always leading us gently like that mm -hmm. out of the confines of sort of more rigid, dogmatic faith and into something a little bit more tender, mm -hmm. a little bit, I don't know if fluid is the right word, but a little bit more malleable. And as we grow, our faith grows. I hope so. Otherwise, it's an antique. I mean, the way you talk about it never changing, that's like in order to pray faithfully, we must ignore everything that is happening around us and in us. That's right. <laughs> and, that's that's and, all. <laughs> and, and become plasticized. Yeah, so I'm not for it. plasticized prayer. I'm not either. <laughs> that trade-off feels too hard. Um, <laughs> you mentioned this just now very briefly, but in Rhythm of Prayer, your your portion explores the idea of God or of being with God, obviously in nature, but also in breath, which you just mm -hmm. touched on. Um, you, you assert to us that perhaps we don't always need uh, grandiose or formal preambles to commune mm -hmm. with God that he's already on the mountain with us, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. I, you have, you've written about this and taught this and led this four years, I feel like some of my earliest um, glimpses of this were from you wow. well before I kind of understood it experientially what you meant. Can you share a little bit about you, your personal story and how you've arrived there and this sense that God is already with us and we are already communing and we are already communicating and um, some of it is a little bit more mysterious and in the soft tissue of the thing, not just the bones. Oh, I love the soft tissue, which doesn't survive, right? All archaeology mm. is about the hard things, the guns, the bones, That's the right. buildings, but where did the soft things go? Mm. Um, so the business about being God with us, I mean, I've, I've struggled with that. I read a little book called When God is Silent. Uh, so part of realizing God is with us is giving up illusions. That means that God is very chatty and, and always available. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm an introvert, so I recognize one when I see one. And, and sometimes God with us means God's silent and withdrawn and mm -hmm. that that does not mean God's gone. But I also noticed how many religious authorities and gurus make a fortune over the idea that God is far away and that there's some magic mm -hmm that we have to perform, you know, or buy a yes. product or yep. follow a routine. And really, if you dig very far into that, it's about how to control God, how to get God to respond better or how to feel better about my own prayer life. So I've also gotten suspicious about that and to decide that to trust that God is with us, even when God's quiet or, or not easy to um, mm. talk to, is mm. a rebellion against those who would control access or tell yeah. us we're not good enough or not. Mm -hmm not ready. Mm. So there. That's comforting for all of us who have mm. expected a nonstop barrage of messaging in a divine mm. way and discover that in truth, there's, there's quiet, there's stillness. Um, mm. Sometimes there's silence and that's just as godly. 
and just as connected even that really takes some discipline and practice to discover um, a lot of your ideas in rhythm of prayer but also just in your work in general it seems like it draws from some other religious traditions from around the world some buddhist leanings some some other there's so many other um, faiths in the world that have a lot to say um and i'm i wonder if you think that's true and if your time mm-hmm. as a world religion professor mm-hmm. um influenced your ability to learn and to listen from other traditions at the same time that those um tenets deepen your own christian faith sure sure and the good thing about well my understanding of my christian faith is it's the the religion of the neighbor and it's it's the religion uh, you know whose prime teacher said if you've got to choose between your religion and your neighbor choose your neighbor yes because i never told you to love your religion and so that's a great that. help and a liberation right away so i have soaked up the others and i've got holy envy of almost all of them but as you say <laughs> what they've done when i get really envious mm-hmm. is turn me back to my own tradition mm-hmm. to dig deeper because in 2000 years almost everything's in there somewhere you know, either in scripture or in the traditions that have grown out of it that can Mm. give me back lost treasure. So, you know, we may end up talking about love of creation, which is, I think, a lost treasure for Mm. Christians who've been taught that God is above and outside of creation. And any love of creation is pagan or druid or new agey or or something. So I I find that not true. You know, there's Mm. a strain of Christianity called creation spirituality. You can hear people talking about Celtic Christianity. And what I think they mean is a trust in the, um, we don't live in a soulless creation. You know, we live in this remarkable world where all breath comes from the divine and the divine inspires all that lives. So how could the divine not be? you know, mm-hmm. in this as well, like a trademark or a thumbprint. So, mm-hmm. so I have found that in Christianity and will not let it go. Mm. I that um is a, uh-huh. a sort of faith tenet that has been new for me probably in the last uh-huh. 15 years just certainly did not wasn't raised to cherish creation and to see it as sacred and even as an extension of faithfulness our stewardship of the earth and our even our enjoyment of it I I, mm-hmm. I my f- my the faith of my childhood did not teach me that God had any interest in our <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> that was just not. In fact, the opposite was more true. Like the harder something was, probably the godlier it was, or the more I denied myself something that felt beautiful or wonderful, that probably meant I was being obedient. Um, oh, and so this this oh, idea so that yeah, isn't that sad. That God it made is. this world to just be so enjoyed and mm-hmm. to heal us and to nurture nurture us. And that feels so crystal clear true to me now that I'm shocked that it wasn't always. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, some other faith traditions are really mm-hmm. good at that and mm-hmm. have raised that up to like, I think a lot of our attention and I'm grateful for that as well. Mm-hmm. This year's been in some ways, beautiful, like all years, and in some ways, gut-wrenching, like all years. I think, you know, I'm down here in Texas, and we have seen such um, kind of just unfathomable, like gun violence and loss um, this year uh, in Uvalde, and of course, all around the United States. It's We're not unique. It just was close to home this time, and Mm -hmm. um, and just so so many losses. The it's been a hard year, and collectively we've suffered. And the pandemic has created so much pain and continued suffering. We're still in it. And so, from mm-hmm. I, I'd like to hear from you, because uh, I know that you've learned this over the years. Because l- life is hard. That is just true. Where faith d- is an inoculation mm-hmm. against life or pain. Mm-hmm. Um, And so what have you learned along the way about grief and Mm -hmm. how to hold your grief, how to manage your grief, what to do with your grief Mm -hmm. um, in a way that both allows you to move through it and heal, but also is healing for the world? 
Now, this is going to be hard to say because headlines are how the larger world is delivered to me, but it's also full of stereotypes because it has to move fast, move fast, give you the news, move on to the next news. I just got a letter from a man in Australia who said he found my work and he was so pleased to find it because he thought all Southerners were stupid, backward people, you know, who mm. walked around with Marlboros rolled up in their T-shirt. And I just thought, good grief, do you, you know? So, yeah. so I, I read the headlines twice a day and in between I don't because mm. headlines give me omniscience, but no omnipotence. In other words, they show me all the grief going on everywhere, but they give me nothing to do but be broken by it. In other words, they give me a God's eye view with no godlike ability Mm -hmm. to take it all in. So in order to prevent a calloused heart or one that just deadens and scrolls through the headlines, um, I limit my exposure and I read my local newspaper, which only comes out twice a week. I read every page, you know, with the recipes that are combined with Bible passages and the, sure. the celebrations of the 50th anniversaries and the little kids making greeting cards for the folks at the convalescent home. So I keep the local in there with the global. That's good. But I also um, attend to the griefs right in front of me locally. Huh. Um, there's plenty going on in my little county that is grievous. And Mm -hmm. if I break my heart over what's happening everywhere else, I won't be Mm -hmm. as attentive to what's happening here. I'm reading a book called This Here Flesh by Cole Arthur Riley. I don't know if she's on your list. Oh, she's been on the show. I read Uh every word of that book, Uh every word of it. Uh, I'm going to read it. She's profound. It's amazing. And she just ran me through the 23rd Psalm again about how rest is a kind of salve to anxiety and grief. Mm -hmm that the same psalm that talks about walking through the shadow of death is the psalm that talks about being led to green pastures and besides still waters. So I'm a, my final answer to your question is I've got to attend to the sustainability of a supple heart. And, and all of that means, you know, as we've been talking about, kind of changing closer, further back, local, global, just finding a way to remain present mm-hmm. to all the things you just named and more without becoming wooden or... Mm-hmm. Um, completely fatigued beyond any usefulness. So, Mm. and that's a work in progress. Yeah, me too. Um, On the other side, on the other side of the equation, what was your, if you have one, your favorite thing of 2022, your favorite (laughs) memory or experience Mm -hmm. or whatever that kind of rises to the top for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, would like to tell you it was lunch with the Dalai Lama, maybe, you know, or, <laughs> you know, when I received the medal of something from sure? somebody. Uh-huh. But the truth is, I just um, cycled out of my zero birthday into a birthday with a one in it. Yeah. And and it was just a week ago. And I spent mm. it in the North Carolina Arboretum with mm. my beloved of 40 years, yeah. uh, uh, walking trails and watching people run with their dogs and eating a sandwich by a creek. And, and taking pictures of leaves with our snapshot things so we could figure out what the heck that was. And it was mm-hmm. just bliss. It was a little kiss of eternal life, you know, mm-hmm. on a birthday. So th- so I would rather think about something that happened last week than go rummaging around for January or February. It, like it seems it. to me it'll always be terrific if I can find somewhere, you know, a favorite memory that happened a week ago. That is so good. What a wonderful answer. That just sent my brain spinning like, yeah, it's my favorite thing from this week. What's my favorite thing from last week? There's always something. There is. There's something. always something. There are lovely uh, things to celebrate mm-hmm. and to cherish. Um, what about this, Barbara? What are you most hopeful for about 2023? I, mm-hmm. as we look ahead, knowing, of course, as always, we will. There will be painful. Things, there will be suffering, but there will also be beauty. There will be joy. There will be love. There will be new babies. Life keeps going in a beautiful way, too. So I wonder what you're personally looking forward to. Let me deal with hope for a minute, because okay. this is something I have gotten from teaching other traditions is the way in which hope can be, doesn't have to be, but can be an escape hatch. Mm. Hope can become a way of not being in the present a way of refusing what is happening right now and a a kind of 
insistence on a better thing coming, you know, and so mm. I'm real wary of hope unless it functions right here, right now. And, and so hope it becomes does. really a wish to be more faithful to the reality I'm planted in when it's horrible and when it's lovely and to keep my responsiveness as uh, limber as I can to keep mm. my responsiveness. You know, if, if the, my job in life now is to attend to what's happening every day and then Part two, to respond as best I'm able, you know, through a bow, through a, a gift of time or money, through a blueberry pie. But the attending and responding, my hope for 2023 is that I can keep that up yeah. um, and that I can continue to let other people's lives interrupt mine, that the, the trouble the world is in, both human and climate, you know, just to stay tender. I want to stay tender. My mm -hmm. hope for 2023 is I can stay tender and then and very selfishly that I can expand, expand a circle of friends, you know, to people I haven't had time for because friendship's not productive, you know, in the way uh, that books are and, sure. and, and events on speaking calendars and things. Yeah. So my, my hope is I can become even more embedded in my community mm -hmm. and, and useful and responsive there. Mm. What did I leave out though? Surely I have something more noble than that. Surely. I'm oh not no, that's noble. Okay. <laughs> no, I love that. I, I particularly love the anticipation of making new room, fresh room mm. for friends, for friendship. Friendship to me is one of the anchors of my life. I, mm. um, uh, many, many things that I do could fall away and um, I would still have a really rich and beautiful life and friendship is not one of them. That is, that is a through line for me year mm -hmm. after year after year. And I bang that drum all the time. And so I actually mm -hmm. love to hear you say that because it can mm -hmm. get crowded out for sure. Yeah. Of course it, it can. can. It doesn't, um, you're not rewarded, um, mm -hmm. for how much you invest in your friendships, right. uh, like it's you important. are for how much you invest in a book. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier, this is the age when all the cliches come true. You know, life mm. is short yeah. and and grief is the price we pay for love and yeah. all flesh is grass. And guess mm. what? Love, you know, intimacy, closeness, friendship. That's what yeah. that's what counts. That's what lasts. It is yeah. what lasts. Yeah. I was um, listening to a podcast yesterday, a clip of one. And she was a, a scientist. A, um, she worked in in biology, but she just said the greatest predictor of a longer life that by a, by a mile, way more than anything you might think is, um, the number and quality of connected relationships. That's it. More than what we eat, more than how much we move our bodies. Um, it supersedes if we drink or smoke, um, that connectedness is the factor in yeah. our longevity and, and ultimately our happiness. And so I, I, when you, you don't need a more noble answer than the one that you gave, mm -hmm. I have one more question for you. Um, since this is our benediction, um, episode, I wondered yeah. if, if you would be willing to kind of speak over us, um, help us close out this year together, a prayer or a blessing or a reading or, um, anything, anything that you would just like to sort of speak over this community as we close the door gently on 2022 and we look ahead to a new year and, um, would love your leadership in that. I'm going to do that. And I was warned you were going to ask me that. Mm -hmm. So this one was so important. I'm a writer. I wrote it yeah. down. But oh, first, my perfect. benediction is is to you for doing mm -hmm. this, for being pastor to this community and for ending the year in this way. Because I think in the questions you've asked me, everybody listening can answer those questions, right? For yeah, themselves. That's right. And, and that's where the beauty of this um, arises is not mm -hmm. in what either of us said, but what our conversation brings up in other people. That's right. So, so with a whole lot of other people I could quote, I'll, I'll give you a benediction I wrote down for this episode. Thank right? you. So I'll do it with my eyes open. The years are short, but the days are long. And that's a blessing, not a curse. There is so much for us to notice every single day. 
so many ways we can respond. So my farewell prayer to 2022 and my blessing over all of you who listen is to find a moment today to put on the brakes, to stop, just stop what you're doing and take a deep breath, realizing that the air moving through you has moved through the lungs of all creation. There's the steam of lava in you. There's the breath of dinosaurs in you, of babies' first cries, of dying people's last breaths, of rainforests and whale spouts and everything that lives put there by the genius of the one who created you and placed you in this luminous web of being. That will be as true on the first day of next year as it is on the last day of this year. So rejoice with those who rejoice and lament with those who lament in all the big and little ways you can invent because God knows that the world needs you to do that this day and the next day and all the days to come. Amen. Mm. Well, That was lovely. Woofed. Thank you. (laughs) Ah, Goodness. Ah. Thank you so much for that. That was so beautiful. Just right. You know, I can't let you go because this is the very last thing. As you know, (laughs) your question Mm. is my final question for every episode. The amount of Mm. times I have said your name on this show is so many. I'm like, this is the question for one of my favorite teachers, Barbara Brown Taylor. (laughs) I have said that phrase a billion times. So first of all, thank you for this thoughtful question that you put out into the world so many years ago. But I'll ask you, like I ask everybody, like you originally asked us, what's saving your life right now? I looked out today and I saw my two broken down old racehorses playing like six-year-old boys. They were doing this tail pulling, nose bumping thing. And the life that is all around me and and the certainty of change, Jen, this is the most important thing. You started out with it. The certainty of change. Um, is saving my life because Mm -hmm. when things are horrible, they're going to change. And when they're wonderful, they're going to change. And my community is, is in that the community of all of us who cannot prevent the changes that occur and who know that loves the price we pay, you know, when, when we're, when we're saddled with loss. So, so what's saving my life now is, consenting to being part of the cycle of of Mm. life and seasons and ozone and and playing horses and and people still mourning their lost loved ones from this year so thank you for the opportunity to answer that question every day of my life (laughs) well you are a treasure among us and Mm. um thank you for leading us so um faithfully for a really long time (laughs) Um, and that's just by you being you and, and living your life, but doing it in a way that we could see it and learn from it. Yeah. And it's meant so much to me. So, yeah. um, all, all the love I can send you from down here in Texas to mm. you and the, the broken down horses and the blueberry <laughs> pies and all the magic of life. Thank you. You're so welcome. And with that, we send our gratitude and our thanks to the year 2022, Um, all the ways that it has helped us to grow and to change, even the hard things and the beautiful things. And we open our arms to 2023 and what's ahead. Um, As far as it goes here in the show, the For the Love podcast team wants to thank you for another beautiful year community. We just could never have dreamed we would be five years into the show with you, with our guests, with our team. Um, What a joy it is. I I just, there's no way to fully express it, but thank you for being with us for another year. Thank you for seeing 2022 through with us and for joining our conversations and for all the ways in which you've contributed. We so look forward to what 2023 is going to bring this community and what we can do and how we can serve you. And so genuinely on behalf of Amanda and I and Laura and her podcast team, thank you for being here. We love you. It's our joy and it's our delight to serve you week in and week out.